The 20th century has been an amazing hundred years for the state of Oregon. It began with settlers hacking out a living from the forest wilderness and ended with the silicon forest computer industry. In between, we built one of the most beautiful highways in America, tamed the mighty Columbia, and passed the nation's first pollution laws. We happily watched the birth of a large baby and got angry as disciples of an Indian guru tried to take over a community. We followed the leadership of a charismatic governor and the teamwork of a world championship basketball team. We endured raging forest fires, tremendous windstorms, and tragic floods, and a volcano that blew its top. Oregon Public Broadcasting and the Oregon Historical Society look back at Oregon's memorable century. Production funding for Oregon's Memorable Century has been provided by the Collins Foundation. The Collins Foundation is dedicated to improving the quality of life in Oregon. In the 20th century, Oregon earned a national reputation as a state blessed with astounding natural beauty and the will to protect it a state where voters will try new ideas. This program is about some of the events that shaped Oregon during the past hundred years, things that helped make Oregon, Oregon. During the long migration west, 19th century settlers faced an important choice at a fork in the trail. They could turn south to maybe strike it rich in the California gold fields, or head on to the Oregon Territory for a more modest living working the land. Then it tells something, I think, about the pioneers who came here, that they would eschew maybe being rich and striking gold, come here where they would strike a different kind of richness, but good everyday living in a beautiful place. Like those first pioneers, most of the 400,000 Oregonians at the turn of the century had chosen this as a place to live. They had come here to what was then a raw, frontier lifestyle to make a living off the land. In 1900, Oregon had the economy of a developing nation, a raw material provider. The first timber boom had come just after the first settlers arrived on the Oregon Trail, supplying timber for the California Gold Rush of 1849. Logging was limited to land near the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. Oxen could haul the logs a short distance, but rivers were the only way to move timber far. Preservation wasn't much of a concern. Using these methods, loggers had barely touched Oregon's vast forest stands. But at the turn of the century, that was all changing. New money, new technology, and new talent would soon transform the forest products industry. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire helped spark the next boom. Eastern and Midwestern capital saw an opportunity cutting Oregon wood to rebuild the city. Railroads moved logging operations away from the rivers. Steam donkeys replaced slow-moving oxen. Timber was becoming big business. Simon Benson is perhaps the personification of the development of the forest products industry in the 20th century in Oregon. He developed means of getting logs out of the forest very quickly and then putting them into log rafts, taking them down the coast to California, and uh, building mills down there to cut the lumber. He made a lot of money, much of which he brought back to Oregon. And of course, his influence in terms of the Columbia Gorge Highway, Benson High School, Benson Hotel, other things, uh, was a direct proportion to his success as a lumberman. With the outbreak of World War I, many workers enlisted. 
Oregon was known as the volunteer state, supplying the most soldiers per capita. Portland's National Guard was the first in the country mobilized for service. But timber was Oregon's greatest contribution to the war effort. We had what was called the Spruce Brigade here. And spruce and fir and other trees were used to build aircraft, ships, housing, of course, barracks. So Oregon provided an important natural resource for the war. It was an arsenal, in, in, in effect. After the war, the boom continued. Men made good money in the woods and sawmills. It lasted until the Great Depression hit and demand for lumber plummeted. It would take another world war to get them back in the woods. Early in the century, the state's most deadly natural disaster hit the small town of Hepner in eastern Oregon. Mindful of the need for water in the dry climate, Henry Hepner had located his town along Willow Creek. The town attracted wheat farmers and sheep and cattle ranchers. By 1900, more than a thousand settlers called Hepner home. The future seemed bright. But on Sunday, June 14, 1903, the waters of Willow Creek that had given birth to the town nearly destroyed it. A sudden afternoon thunderstorm rolled over the hills above town. Trees, fences, and debris washed into the creek, damming it up. Water quickly built up. And when the dam burst, it unleashed a wall of water on the unsuspecting town. The torrent swept away people and animals. Houses floated off foundations. In minutes, the flood killed about 250 people, nearly a quarter of the town. As tragic as it was, it could have been worse. On horseback, Leslie Matlock and Bruce Kelly raced the floodwaters 10 miles downstream to warn the town of Lexington. Jean Stockard heard the story from her grandparents. They'd been to church in the morning and had, had their dinner and then heard the shouts about the flood coming and just apparently grabbed the children and ran up and sat on the hillside and watched the water come through. The disaster was front page news. Volunteers came to help clean up the mess, recover bodies, and dig graves. It was heartbreaking work. My grandfather told a story about a little girl who died holding a, a dolly in her hand, and they never found her parents. And uh, so they buried her holding the doll, and uh, he, was, he was very affected by that. Soup kitchens were set up to feed the homeless. The Palace Hotel fed anyone who showed up for free as a spirit of community replaced the despair. In a testament to human optimism, most people decided to stay and rebuild. Within a season, the land was again producing. New homes and businesses erased most traces of the sudden flood. But the loved ones who died are not forgotten. And the rebuilt town of Hepner endures today, perhaps with a stronger sense of community because of that terrible day in June and the way the community rallied to help their neighbors in need. Sentiment for conserving natural resources had very early roots in Oregon. In 1879, Congress gave the president the power to reserve forests from sale, essentially making them off limits for commercial exploitation or homesteading. In 1892, the Bull Run watershed became the first such reserve in Oregon. The next year, President Grover Cleveland reserved Crater Lake, a wilderness area of unparalleled beauty. But the lake's advocates pushed Congress to grant national park status. When conservation-friendly Theodore Roosevelt became president, he boosted their cause, and on May 22, 1902, the president signed the bill establishing Crater Lake National Park. In spite of difficult access to the park by horse and later by motor car, tourism in the area continued to grow. In 1915, the historic Crater Lake Lodge was open for visitors. It attracted guests from around the world until 1989 when, after years of neglect, 
the structure was condemned. A public outcry saved it from the wrecking ball. The lodge was dismantled and rebuilt. It reopened in 1995, restored to an atmosphere reminiscent of the 1920s. Crater Lake is still the only national park in Oregon. National forests make up about 25% of Oregon, but few people hiking the woods know that most of these public lands are the result of a hasty decision made in secret 3,000 miles away. A decision that changed the face of Oregon forever. In 1906, Congress had just passed a law taking away the president's power to reserve forest land. In short order, Gifford Pinchot, new head of the U.S. Forest Service, and President Theodore Roosevelt poured over the maps and the forest surveys that had been, been done by the U.S. Geological Survey in the decade of the 1890s, and in a period of 10 days, withdrew millions of acres for national forests in the Pacific Northwest. These have since been called the Midnight Forest Reserves because they were withdrawn during the midnight hours at the White House before that bill would be signed and become law. Consequence for the state of Oregon, of course, is Wallowa Whitman National Forest, the Ochico, the Fremont, the Rogue River, the Siskiyou, the Siusla, the Mount Hood. These national forests are a legacy of that quick action by a conservation-minded president and the new head of the Forest Service. In 1904, Oregonians passed the nation's first initiatives, one calling for direct primary elections, another a local option liquor law. In effect, the powers of initiative, referendum, and recall gave ordinary citizens the same power as lawmakers. So popular did these become, and so admired were they nationally, that they were heralded as the Oregon system and were adopted by many other states across the United States. Of course, only men could vote on initiatives or anything else. Since the mid-1800s, American women such as Susan B. Anthony had been campaigning for the ultimate right of citizenship, the right to vote. The suffragist battle was being fought state by state. A chief crusader emerged in Oregon, Abigail Scott Dunaway. Abigail lobbied tirelessly to get an equal suffrage amendment in Oregon but male voters resisted, primarily due to another hot issue of the time. They were afraid that temperance was tied to it, or abolition. And some argued that if women got the right to vote, that surely they would take away men's right to drink. At the dawn of the 20th century, the suffrage campaign suffered a crushing blow and the Portland Oregonian launched massive editorial opposition. The paper's editor was Abigail's brother, Harvey Scott, voters turned down women's suffrage four more times. In 1912, public support was stronger. Women had won the right to vote in Washington, Idaho, and California. But the Oregon movement faced perhaps its biggest loss. Abigail fell deathly ill with pneumonia and blood poisoning. Miraculously, she survived, saying she could not afford to die until suffrage was achieved. That year, Oregon became the seventh state in the Union to give women the right to vote, eight years before the National Constitutional Amendment. Governor Oswald West asked Abigail to write out the Equal Suffrage Proclamation by hand. And she became the first woman to register to vote in Multnomah County. Abigail Scott Dunaway cast her first vote in the 1914 election. The 100-year anniversary of Lewis and Clark's explorations of the Oregon country gave the state cause to celebrate. The Oregon Historical Society was charged with planning an event to mark the occasion. The society came up with the idea of a World's Fair, an international exposition. And very quickly, political and business leaders grabbed onto the idea. And so, the Lewis and Clark Centennial, an American Pacific Exposition and Oriental Fair was born, and the world was invited. Giles Lake in northwest Portland was chosen as the site, and a frenzy of building began. A 
On opening day, June 1st, 1905, Spanish Renaissance-style exhibit halls were filled with wares from as far away as Japan and Russia. The Atiyah family came to Portland from Syria to market fine textiles. There's a photograph of my father at the Lewis and Clark Fair. And I asked my father one time, you know, how come he came to Portland? And he said that somebody came through and said this was a good area to sell Oriental rugs. With a boost from the fair, the Atiyah's rugs soon graced the homes of the timber and land barons of Portland. Fairgoers were treated to exotic attractions like the streets of Cairo and Carnival of Venice, replete with ballerinas, opera singers, and gondoliers. By the end of summer, the fair had hosted a million and a half visitors from all around the world, a tremendous boost to the state's budding tourism industry. The Great Extravaganza, as it was later called, netted the princely sum of $84,461. By the fall of 1905, the temporary buildings were dismantled and the fairgrounds cleared. The lake was later lost under a flood of silt, and the land was slowly converted into a thriving industrial area. One landmark that survived was the forestry building. Called the world's largest log cabin, it lasted until 1963 when the massive structure caught fire and was destroyed. The impact of the fair was far-reaching. It put Oregon on the map as a desirable place to visit and to live. It was really a tremendous boost, I think, in, in terms of the economic and, and uh, just in-migration of people to, to Oregon and particularly Portland. We can look back at the 10 years immediately following the exposition and see that the, the state grew by about 50 percent in population and in the economy, based directly and indirectly on people's experience with the exposition. An Oregonian newspaper editorial summed it up best, the Lewis and Clark Exposition officially marked the end of the old and the beginning of the new Oregon. Soon after the, the Lewis and Clark Exposition, a movement reached Oregon called the Good Roads Movement, which was a national effort to build roads, to make it easier for Americans to get around the countryside. And the movement in Oregon was built around the slogan, Get Oregon Out of the Mud. How appropriate. The unlikely hero of Good Roads was an eccentric genius named Sam Hill the son of a Midwestern railroad magnet. He dreamed of building a paved highway roughly paralleling the railroad through the Columbia Gorge. Not just any road, a road to match the gorge's beauty. Hill got financial backing from Simon Benson, the same Benson who had made a fortune selling lumber. On July 17, 1916, the Columbia Gorge Highway officially opened it was an engineering and aesthetic masterpiece. For the first time, it was possible to drive from the wheat fields of eastern Oregon through the Cascade Mountains to the Willamette Valley. An automobile could make the trip in a short day's travel. Sam Hill's fantastic dream had come true. Largely because of Hill's influence, the Oregon legislature funded a state highway commission to improve roads. The state of Oregon built the Pacific Highway, Highway 99, which was a north-south corridor from the Columbia River to the California border through the Willamette, Umpqua, and Rogue River Valleys. In 1917, another milestone for travel. Construction was completed on the Interstate Bridge. Sam Hill was there presiding over the opening ceremonies. For the first time, people could drive over the Columbia River. The Highway bridge over the Columbia River uh, was finally a recognition that automobile traffic between Oregon and Washington had reached a point where you could no longer depend on ferries. The new roads connected communities which had been isolated and they helped bring economic expansion. But they also led to some Oregon treasures being protected. Way back in 1913, Governor Oswald West established Oregon's tradition of open beaches by declaring them to be public highways. Governor West's argument was that the beaches from Aboriginal times through the Pioneer Epoch 
had been the highways and the trails of Oregon. Therefore, there was an established public right-of-way to drag a wide tire wagon, to ride one's horse, or to walk on the beach. In the process of buying rights-of-way for roads, the state acquired land suitable for parks. That was the birth of the Oregon State Park System. These proved highly popular with travelers. And in a sense, the uh, Columbia Gorge Scenic Highway, with its waysides at waterfalls, was a pre-state uh, park model. Over a period of 20 years, the state park system grew rapidly, with much of the construction and trail work done during the Depression by the CCC. Some of the remarkable parks in the system uh, would include Jesse B. Honeyman at Florence, Oregon. Another one would be Silver Falls State Park near Silverton, Oregon, which has a marvelous assemblage of civilian conservation core structures, but also a trail system that uh, connects visitors with the beautiful waterfalls in this forest in the foothills of the Western Cascades. Coming up on Oregon's memorable century, we survived the Great Depression, and WPA Make Work projects give us two of Oregon's most lasting landmarks. A tremendous fire sweeps over the coast range. Workers arrive to construct ships for World War II. They also build Oregon's second largest city, and then watch as it is swept away. Oregon's memorable century will continue. Now please take a minute and show your support by becoming a member of Oregon Public Broadcasting. In 1922, a small grocery retailer opened a new store in Portland. His name, Fred G. Meyer. And the idea behind that store changed the way people shop, not only in Oregon, but soon across the entire country. While operating a coffee company and collection of food shops in a downtown market, Mr. Meyer had spotted a problem with how people were shopping. Women would have to go to a store and buy meat in one store and then they'd have to go down the block and buy their vegetables somewhere else and they'd have to go somewhere else and buy the stores and running the company up until his death in 1978 at age 92. Since then his company has continued to grow. Through mergers Fred Meyer first expanded across the West then joined Kroger to become part of the largest supermarket chain in the country. But their familiar name remains. Fred Meyer continues to maintain headquarters in Portland. During the Great Depression, Oregon, like the rest of the country, was in economic chaos. Eighty percent of lumber mills had shut down. Families were abandoning their farms and businesses. Work was scarce. Hope arrived in 1932 with presidential candidate Franklin D. Roosevelt. He promised that if elected, he'd put people to work on public works projects, like building a giant dam on the Columbia River. Roosevelt stuck to his promise. Soon after his election, construction began on Bonneville Dam, one of the biggest WPA projects to come out of the Depression. Bonneville Dam was a relief project in putting 4,000 men to work and a great multiplier effect on the local economy for those who were involved in servicing that labor force. Soon the site was buzzing with activity. Trucks, barges, shovels, and crews worked 24 hours a day. The conditions were harsh, but spirits were high. Workers earned at least 50 cents an hour, more if they had a skill. The Army Corps of Engineers even hired folk singer Woody Guthrie to visit the construction site, entertaining workers and writing songs. Roll Columbia, won't you roll, 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 
If the crew imagined themselves in a contest to harness the Columbia River, their star player was a 441-ton shovel nicknamed Mr. Monaghan. Bigger than a house, it could scoop 12 tons of rock and gravel in one bite. But what really caught visitors' attention was Mr. Monaghan could walk. Not everyone supported the dam. There were great criticisms that there simply wasn't the market for that kind of power. More far-sighted people said there may not be the market now, but there soon will be. Others were concerned about Bonneville's effect on wildlife, especially Columbia River salmon. Bonneville Dam rose from the riverbed, eventually standing 20 stories high and five football fields wide. In 1937, President Roosevelt returned to dedicate Bonneville, a triumphant public works project he had promised just five years before. When Bonneville's turbines began generating electricity, they produced an enormous amount of power, three times what the region could use. No one could have predicted that very soon the nation would need every bit of that power. From Bonneville Dam, the president motored 78 miles on rough and curving roads to dedicate another WPA project, Timberline Lodge. Mount Hood had long been a popular site, even in the 19th century, when people had to get there by horseback and, and foot. As early as 1926, the Forest Service had plans to provide an overnight lodge. The Depression put those plans on hold until 1936, when money from the New Deal revived plans for a Grand Lodge, primarily as a way of putting people to work. From March to June, workers dug through 12 to 18 feet of snow just to put in a road to Timberline. At the site, construction workers spent weeks in camp, happy to be earning about 90 cents an hour. They dragged rocks from the slopes of Mount Hood and stonemasons built the walls. Many of these masons had worked on the Columbia Gorge Highway. The east and west wings were built first, and then the huge wood columns were lifted into place for the magnificent central lodge. Aided by a late winter, workers had the building enclosed before heavy snows hit. Then attention turned to the inside. Portland interior decorator Marjorie Hoffman Smith was in charge of the artistic side of the project. We had a few fine artists, but there weren't many. But we had a great many willing craftsmen. All were grateful for the work. Well, it's probably very hard for you today to realize what the Depression meant. Because people were so desperate, as you know, they jumped out of windows and they sold apples on streets. So in these projects of ours, we were giving people a living wage and a sense of security. There was one last minute detail. The simple chairs at the lodge had no arms. Because of his disability, the president needed an armchair. Working through the weekend, the craftsman got it done just in time. Here at Mount Hood, will come thousands and thousands of visitors in the coming years. Timberline Lodge was built to put people back to work during the Depression. It's hard to believe today, but from start to finish, the project was completed in 18 months. The total cost, less than a million dollars. The workers earned their pay and more, leaving us today with a still stunning lodge in a magnificent setting. During the Great Depression, some loggers could still find work in the vast old-growth forest west of Portland. But in 1933, the sound of the axe was silenced by the roar of a tremendous fire. On August 14th, a hot, dry east wind prompted a warning that logging should cease. The warning was too late. 
State forestry officials report yesterday's logging fire in Gales Creek Canyon near Forest Grove has now raged into a full-scale forest fire. Apparently, the last timber operator working in the dry woods decided to haul in one more log before closing. The strong east winds pushed flaming debris two miles ahead of the main blaze, setting new fires. Finally, the east winds lessened fog rolled in and the fire stopped before reaching the town of Tillamook. But the fire left a painful sight. Bare trees stood naked in what looked like a wasteland. The fire had destroyed enough timber to build a million homes, but many trees were marketable. Salvage operations began while the ash from the fire was still warm. Roads and railroads were built to get at the timber. New fires in 1939 and 45 spread the devastation and all 400,000 acres burned. This was, of course, a tremendous loss for fish habitat, for wildlife, and standing timber resource. And for private timber owners and for counties, it was an impossible task either to reforest it or to continue to pay the taxes on those charred ruins. So as a consequence, a lot of that land ultimately ended up in the ownership of the state of Oregon. In 1948, voters approved a large bond measure to replant trees. Over the next 25 years, an amazing 72 million seedlings were planted, most by prison inmates and contract workers, but volunteers also helped. For years, teams of school kids helped with the replanting. Many grew up thinking of the Tillamook as their forest. It is still the largest reforestation effort ever undertaken by a state. Everyone who had held a seedling felt they were part of the miracle. In 1983, exactly 50 years after the burn, the first replanted tree was cut for commercial sale. Flying over the Tillamook now, it's hard to picture the barren hills that followed the fire. Recreationists enjoy the restored forest and a new generation must determine how much of this forest should be cut to boost today's economy and how much preserved for fish, wildlife, and recreation. In the 1930s, Oregon voters used the initiative to achieve another milestone, the nation's first pollution control laws. That's Portland Harbor at that time. In 1937, Phil Schneider was a student in the fisheries department at Oregon State University. He helped his professor make this film to dramatize the water quality problems they put baby steelhead into the river. I can recall the ones that we tested one afternoon. I, I couldn't believe that 45 seconds that those fish would be dead and it was hard to believe it. It was that bad. The film had the desired effect. In 1938, by a three-to-one margin, voters approved an initiative creating the state sanitary authority to clean up the river. It was the nation's first law dealing with pollution and the forerunner of today's Department of Environmental Quality. Unfortunately, because of the Depression and then World War II, not much money was available to address the problems. As we'll see later, that would take 30 years and another film. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, everything changed. The United States was now at war. The military needed men and supplies. All of a sudden, there were more jobs to do than workers. The Depression was over. In spite of the war, the country's mood was upbeat. There was a common goal, and everybody pitched in to help. To win the war, the nation needed ships in a hurry. Henry Kaiser's Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation used mass production methods to build hundreds of ships in record time. Swan Island became known as the Yard of Champions because of the speed with which it turned out warships. And finally, only about 70 days after the laying of the first keel section, 
the papers are delivered to the skipper, who is to take the tanker out on her maiden voyage. The shipyards helped fuel another population boom. 160,000 workers came to Oregon during the war, many on trains called magic carpet specials. The worker shortage also brought a new look to the workforce. Workers in the Kaiser yards included women who were not going to war, who were here and available. And they went to work as riveters and assemblers. 25,000 blacks were also recruited to the shipyards. Overnight, Portland's black population increased tenfold. The new wartime population, black and white, needed somewhere to live. Public housing went up almost overnight. The largest was Vanport. Built on the floodplain south of Jansen Beach, it became Oregon's second largest city. The war also created a need for all that Bonneville Dam power. Modern planes required strong and lightweight aluminum, and making aluminum required great amounts of electric power. A thriving aluminum industry sprang up along the Columbia River to take advantage of the previously surplus electricity. Oregon's population growth turned out to be the state's lasting legacy of World War II. But just six months after Pearl Harbor, Oregon did make headlines because of an event that turned out to be insignificant. A Japanese uh, vessel surfaced and shelled Fort Stevens at the mouth of Columbia River, lobbing uh, shells in, in against the sand uh, at that fortification. It was the first attack on a mainland U.S. military installation since the War of 1812. The attack lasted just 15 minutes. No one was hurt, and the fort sustained no damage. Japan also launched balloons designed to carry bombs across the Pacific to the U.S. Most never made it, but one that did proved deadly. On May 5, 1945, Reverend and Mrs. Mitchell of Bly, Oregon, took five children on an outing. While Mr. Mitchell was moving the car, Mrs. Mitchell and the children found a strange object in the woods. While investigating, they must have tugged on it enough to detonate the bomb. Today, in the mountains east of Bly, a monument marks the spot where they died, the only deaths on the American continent due to enemy action during the war. For most Oregonians, the war economy meant good jobs, but with constraints on spending the good wages. There was rationing of tires and gasoline. New automobiles weren't available. So what happened is they saved their money, and they helped create the pent-up demand for housing and consumer goods that would drive the economy after 1945. Demand for housing was so strong after the war that Oregon timber companies couldn't keep up with the demand. For the first time, the government began large-scale timber sales from national forest lands. During the 50s, 60s, and 70s, Oregon supplied about one quarter of all the lumber used in the U.S. There were warnings that we were cutting too fast, but those concerns were mostly ignored. It looked as if the good times could last forever. Blood crisis in the Pacific Northwest. From Oregon to British Columbia, from Idaho to the coast, come reports of disasters. The worst of all, from Vanport, Oregon. Here, floodwaters of the swollen Columbia River broke through a railroad fill and drowned a city. Almost 19,000 people lost their homes, completely ruined in one tragic hour. The kids would come running down Cottonwood Street, coming from the west, coming this way and said, the dike is broken, run, run, run. Regina Flowers was 13 when her family barely escaped the flood with only what they could carry. And I look back, I never seen so much water. It, you know, you just froze there, you just kept looking, and those huge, huge waves, and these houses were riding on these waves. And once in a while, if I can remember, I think I saw people on top of the roof. They climb all the way to the top of the roof, you know, The exact death toll was never determined, but on that Memorial Day, 19,000 people lost their homes and most of their belongings.
1959, Oregon saw a return to its pioneer roots. Horses trotted through towns and wagon trains became common sights on public thoroughfares. It was all part of the celebration of a hundred years of statehood. Festivities around the state kicked off on the official Valentine's Day anniversary. Vice President Richard Nixon unveiled a four-cent centennial stamp in Astoria, then spoke at a Portland banquet for descendants of the state's first settlers. The tradition of the pioneers moving across the Oregon Trail belongs not just to the people of Oregon. It belongs to the United States and to the people of America. Some say the little town of Damascus had the best celebration. Residents built a replica centennial town where gunfighters and men not sporting beards could be thrown into the pokey. Folks donned the duds of the era, including a young governor, Mark Hatfield. Visitors saw the world's longest horse parade and partook in a 3B barbecue. 50 cents for all you can eat, bear, beef, and buffalo. A 21-foot tall candle was made from wax collected from all across the state. It burned for 100 days with a gas flame. A little old-fashioned ingenuity helped the small town with the big ideas perpetuate Oregon's pioneer spirit. Next on Oregon's memorable century, a visionary governor cleans up roadside litter with the nation's first bottle bill. He tries to stop urban sprawl and puts on a controversial rock festival. A sports retailing giant is born. A giant baby makes headlines. A fierce storm rips through the Willamette Valley and the trailblazers are red hot and rolling. Oregon's memorable century continues after this time out for your pledge of support for OPB. The year was 1962, and there was elephantisipation at the Portland Zoo, known as the Oregon Zoo today. Belle was expecting a baby. Her pregnancy was in its 21st month, and the world was watching and waiting. The blessed event finally happened on April 14th at 5.58 a.m., when Belle delivered a 225-pound bundle of joy. Zoo director Jack Marks was overcome. After the birth, he collapsed on the floor of the elephant house. It turned out to be nothing more serious than fatherly nerves. Packy, as he was later christened, was the first U.S. born elephant in 44 years. He became the subject of songs, like one performed by cowboy Heck Harper, and made a prominent appearance in Life magazine. But amid all the celebration, the zoo faced a problem. Belle and her baby didn't belong to them. Belle's owner and trainer offered to sell the pair to the zoo for $30,000, provided they could come up with the money in two weeks. A fundraising campaign was immediately launched and collection cans were placed throughout the city. The drive was a success, and Bell and Packy became permanent residents. They drew record crowds to the zoo that year, becoming the Northwest's second largest tourist attraction, behind the Seattle World's Fair. Packy's birthday is still celebrated each year, a reminder of the community spirit that kept the history-making elephants at home in the City of Roses.
Later that same year, a natural disaster put Oregon back in the headlines. On Columbus Day, a sudden windstorm took the Willamette Valley by surprise. As a college student, Stephen Beckham experienced this bit of history firsthand. And I heard this roar and the wind started to go. And then a tree fell and it chopped a Volkswagen bus right in half at the curb right beside me. Then another set of trees fell against one of the sorority houses and broke through the windows. And at that point, I tucked and rolled and ran right into the shrubbery at the foundation of a house and curled up there because it's just the whole world was blowing away. Portland recorded peak winds of 119 miles an hour. Mount Hebo on the coast recorded a gust of 176 before the wind gauge broke. The Columbus Day storm killed 38 people in Oregon and caused $200 million in property damage. 50,000 homes were badly in need of repair. It took a long time to recover. I remember going four days and nights without any electricity, but it took weeks to cut up all the downed trees and clear away the debris, and months to restore buildings and replace roofs. Anyone who lived through it will never forget that Columbus Day in 1962, the day the worst windstorm ever hit Oregon. In 1964, in Portland's harbor, a freighter unloaded a small shipment of athletic shoes from Japan. Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman, his former track coach at the University of Oregon, had each invested about $500 to become the sole distributor of Tiger Shoes. They called the tiny company Blue Ribbon Sports. Bowerman would work to improve the shoes while Knight looked after the business. The venture had a modest beginning. First year sales totaled just $8,000. 1971, Bowerman had one of his ideas. I was having breakfast with Barbara and she was turning out these waffles. I looked at the, at the cleats on that thing and I thought, I'm gonna put some synthetic rubber in there and I'm gonna take that thing out and see if I don't have a good cleat. And I thought, I looked at my waffle Hey, that's just exactly what I want. The Waffle Soul Shoe was born. By now, Blue Ribbon Sports was a going concern with 45 employees. They've separated from Tiger and are making their own shoe line. One of the employees suggests a new name for the company, Nike, after the Greek goddess of victory. The new name debuts at the 1972 Olympic Trials in Eugene. Steve Prefontaine becomes the first nationally known athlete to endorse Nike shoes. The new name and the waffle shoes are a hit. Nike sales take off when jogging becomes a popular form of exercise and non-athletes begin buying running shoes. By 1979, Nike has 50% of the U.S. market. Knight then transformed athletic shoe marketing with close ties to sports stars. The little company that Knight and Bowerman started with an investment of a little more than $1,000 had revolutionized the business of selling athletic shoes and apparel. As the century comes to a close, Nike is one of Oregon's largest employers, with yearly sales approaching $10 billion. In the 60s, Oregon, like much of the country, was split in its attitude about the Vietnam War. Many people couldn't understand why America was involved. This war must stop. Oregon Senator Wayne Morse was the most outspoken opponent of the war. Eugene McCarthy, another senator opposed to American involvement, announced he would run for president. It looked like the 68 election would be a referendum on Vietnam. But when President Lyndon Johnson decided not to run, Robert Kennedy entered the race. At that time, Oregon had an early primary, so both men campaigned hard in the state. If we can win here in Oregon, we'll go on to win in California. The nation was looking at Oregon as what direction was, this, was the nation going to go in terms of presidential uh, politics. 
And McCarthy won that election, which was a surprise to a lot of people. The same voters who chose an anti-war presidential candidate threw out Senator Morse. Apparently in the mood to shake up government, voters opted instead for a young state legislator named Bob Packwood. Kennedy went on to win the next primary in California. He was shot and killed the same night. Richard Nixon won the presidency, and the war in Vietnam continued. The tension had grown in, in America about the Vietnam War. So we had a polarized community. And here came the American Legion National Convention to be held in Portland, Oregon. And with the legacy of student protests and draft card burnings and confrontations, there was great fear that there would be a gathering of war protesters and a head-on confrontation in the streets of Portland. I know all the costs, but this is the only courageous right thing to do. Oregon had a very creative governor and a risk taker, a real risk taker, who staged a rock concert at McIver Park, Vortex, as, as a means to siphon off some of the energies. And thousands went to Vortex, and they danced and they sang and they took off their clothes and outraged the locals uh, when they went swimming in the river. But nonetheless, the confrontation didn't occur. That risk-taking governor was Tom McCall, soon to gain a national reputation for taking political risks to protect the Oregon environment he so dearly loved. I, I Tom McCall, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will... Tom McCall had taken the oath of office as governor in 1967. He had grown up on the family ranch overlooking the Crooked River in central Oregon. McCall first gained statewide attention as a commentator for KGW-TV News. There he produced a landmark documentary called Pollution in Paradise. It was a call to action to clean up Oregon's air and water. Test nettings in the Willamette show that only carp and other warm water trash fish are able to survive. At no time in the history of the country... As governor, McCall vowed to complete the work voters started when they created the State Sanitary Authority back in 1938. He renamed it the Department of Environmental Quality and appointed L.B. Day to be the first director. McCall and Day expected results. They pressured industries to clean up discharges to the air and to the water and then convinced voters to fund better sewage treatment. And so, finally, we were rewarded when after some 40 years of seeing this river posted against swimming, here is a river, finally, that is safe for swimming. And to a lot of people, this man here is your old friend again. Litter was to be McCall's next target. Throwaway cans and bottles were an expensive eyesore. Oregon became the first state in the nation to require a deposit on all beer and soft drink containers. McCall was a good promoter of ideas that other people were tossing out and taking an idea like a returnable deposit on a bottle and making sense out of it and communicating to a public that this was a good idea. Oregonians developed a sense of pride in the state's reputation for innovation in protecting the environment. McCall tapped into that sentiment by creating the Keep Oregon Green Committee. It's amazing what you found out here. That organization kept growing. Today, it's known as SOLVE. People from all over the state turn up twice a year to help with SOLVE's annual beach cleanups. Solve It, a day when Oregonians turn out to clean up litter and illegal dump sites, is the nation's largest volunteer effort. I welcome visitors. I urge them to come and come many, many times to enjoy the beauties of Oregon. But I also urge them, for heaven's sake, don't move here to live. McCall created another stir when he said Oregon did not want more residents. This was vintage Tom McCall. Uh, it captured a sentiment, it caught good press attention, it caused people to think. And I like to believe that it represented his style of leadership. Many misinterpreted McCall's remarks as being against all business and development. In fact, he was launching another new idea. That California-style urban sprawl was not inevitable. 
that with land use planning, Oregon could chart a different future. The interests of Oregon for today and in the future must be protected from grasping wastrels of the land. We must respect another truism, that unlimited and unregulated growth leads inexorably to a lowered quality of life. I think that we'll live beyond the monument. In 1973, McCall signed Senate time, Bill 100, mandating statewide land use planning. The bill required communities to draw a line defining where development would occur and where farms and forests would be protected. And it was a, an interesting process because right in the legislation were the words Land Conservation Development Commission. The conflict was embedded in the name of the entity, and it meant that there would be both conservation and growth going on simultaneously. McCall predicted land use planning would be his most lasting legacy. He was probably right. A quarter century later, people still argue about where the line should be drawn, what should be conserved, and what developed. But most agree that Oregon is a better place today because we do argue about it and think about it. Like when he have, left office, McCall wrote his own epitaph have. about how he hoped to be remembered. He tried. Oh, Lord, he tried. There was no final victory. But did he not point the way? In 1977, after only seven seasons in the NBA, the Trailblazers claimed the national championship. It had a huge impact on uh, Oregon and the, how Oregon viewed sports. It was the only sports franchise, uh, professional sports franchise in the state, and the team was pretty good. <laughs> when power forward Maurice Lucas joined the team at the beginning of that season, he knew the team had talent but it took a while for the players to learn their roles and how they fit in. About 20 games in, we started to feel a little more comfortable and the ball started moving. We started understanding Jack's system a little more. Jack Ramsey was the new head coach. His concept was that the team would have no stars. Ramsey would exploit the passing ability of center Bill Walton. The Blazers would win by moving the basketball. There's no way that any team or anybody can outrun the pass. And so we thought that if we outpass a team, then, you know, we'll, we'll beat them. By spring, fans were catching on that this team was something special. Then we got a little roll going, and all of a sudden the place is filled up. And before long, I mean, they had signs everywhere <laughs> talking about red, hot, and rolling. In the playoffs, the Blazers won tough series against the Chicago Bulls and the Denver Nuggets. Then they traveled to Los Angeles to take on the Lakers, the team with the best record in the league. It was no contest. Walton made Jabbar work for all his points, while the Blazer guards, led by backup Herm Gilliam, lit up the scoreboard. The Blazers took that series four straight. In the championship series, the Blazers at first had no answer for Philadelphia 76ers star Julius Irvin. But back in Portland, with the Memorial Coliseum crowd screaming, the Blazers got on a roll. With masterful team passing and Bobby Gross running Dr. J ragged, the Blazers took the next four games straight. The Blazers were NBA champs. The beauty of this team was that we shared the game. Uh, we didn't necessarily like each other, uh, we didn't necessarily hang out with each other, but we respected each other's game. When we came to work, everybody came to play. Oregonians loved and respected this team too. The next day, a huge crowd turned out for a quickly arranged team parade through Portland. I had never seen that many people in Portland. Matter of fact, I didn't even know that many people lived in Oregon. <laughs> but they came out, and you just don't know, uh, as an athlete, how many people you really touch uh, until you actually see uh, an event like that. And, I mean, we touched a lot of people. 
Next on Oregon's Memorable Century, spotted owls and salmon ignite controversy about how to save the environment and the economy. Rajneeshis invade Central Oregon. Mount St. Helens reminds us this is volcano country. The Oregon coast gets an unwelcome visitor and a famous movie star. Stay tuned for the conclusion of Oregon's Memorable Century. Early in 1980, a Northwest giant awoke. Mount St. Helens looked placid under its blanket of snow, but scientists were detecting swarms of small earthquakes. The public took notice in March, when St. Helens began blowing off clouds of steam. The steam explosions blasted a new vent on top of the mountain. Then rocks on the north side began to bulge outward sometimes moving as much as five feet a day. Scientists advised preparation for a major eruption. As a precaution, roadblocks were set up to keep the public out of what was thought to be the danger zone. And I'm not going to take my name off of that sign that sandblasted. One man refused to leave, an ornery old cuss named Harry Truman. He'd been running a lodge at Spirit Lake for years and vowed to never leave his mountain. Scientists who went into the danger zone daily to make measurements understood the risk. Well, if it occurs, um, it would probably be uh, no more than a few months on the outside, but it could be as soon as a few hours. From his observation post five miles north of the mountain, Johnston radioed volcano headquarters, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. They were his last words. It was 832. Sunday morning, May 18th. The eruption unleashed a tremendous lateral blast, a shockwave so powerful that it knocked over old growth trees six feet in diameter like so many matchsticks. A huge ash plume rose over the mountain generating its own lightning. It looked like a nuclear explosion. Rescue helicopters and news crews rushed in to assess the damage and search for survivors. What they found was an alien landscape. Spirit Lake was gone. The lush Tudor River Valley buried under debris 150 feet deep. Rapidly melting snow and ice swelled rivers now filled with logs. The floodwaters wiped out bridges and swept away houses like toys. 31 ships were stranded in the Columbia as the mud flow clogged the main channel. 57 people died in the blast, most caught by the fast-moving cloud of superheated ash and debris. All but three were outside the official danger zone. We were thinking we were gonna die. We knew we were. Leslie and Dale Davis were trapped as their truck was pounded with ice and rocks. The wing of our pickup blew out, and all we could do was sit there. It got hot, and it was black. You couldn't see a thing. These are the shoes that I walked out in. With just a thermos of coffee to sustain them, Leslie and Dale walked 26 miles to reach safety. The area of devastation covered 250 square miles, mostly north and west of St. Helens. To the east and south, ash was the problem. The ash cloud first blacked out the sun, made breathing difficult, and caused blizzard-like driving conditions. These guys are crazy. Oh, geez, this is ridiculous. They had whites out just like that, yeah, and they ain't got a chance. Break. Even when driving was safe, clogged air filters brought cars to a halt. 
Subsequent ash eruptions only added to the problems. Businesses and homeowners struggled with the nearly futile task of cleaning up the fine, powdery coating of volcanic ash. The eruption of Mount St. Helens left a lasting mark on the landscape. Mile upon mile of nearly lifeless moonscape. Four billion board feet of timber destroyed, enough to build 300,000 homes. But the eruption taught us much about how volcanoes work and is still teaching us about Northwest ecology. You have a once in a lifetime opportunity to study the process that has shaped the forests of the Cascade Mountains. The area around Mount St. Helens is now a national monument. Along with scientists, visitors can observe as life returns. And in the last 40,000 years, Mount St. Helens has erupted dozens and dozens of times. We have an opportunity to see one particular chapter happen, you know, in, in our lifetime and to watch how an entire ecosystem is, is assembled one species at a time. Perhaps the most bizarre story in Oregon's memorable century began in 1981 with the arrival of an obscure Indian guru. The Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and a few followers planned to build a religious commune on a huge former cattle ranch along Big Muddy Creek east of Madras. At first, the Bhagwan maintained a self-imposed silence. All most of us knew was that he drove Rolls Royces, and he drove a lot of them. His assistant, Ma Nan Sheila, did most of the talking about the Rajneeshi's dream. A very beautiful city, a city, one which has never existed on the universe, where people live in harmony, people live in love. The Bhagwan attracted a following of mostly young Europeans and Americans who considered him to be a living master. Many Rajneeshis donated considerable money to his commune then worked long hours in return for three meals a day, a place to sleep, and the pleasure of seeing their master during his daily drives. For most Oregonians, the whole thing was amusing. Even the Rajneeshis joked about it during public tours of the ranch. For us now, at this point on the ranch, work is our meditation. <laughs> 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Area residents, however, were less amused. They were suspicious about the commune's rapid growth and its free love lifestyle. They're invading, maybe not with bullets, but with money and, uh, and with uh, immoral sex. Money seemed to be no object, but as more and more buildings went up, the commune ran into conflict with land use laws. Thousand Friends of Oregon sued claiming Rajneesh Puram was becoming a city on land zoned for farm use. With their dream city in jeopardy, some Rajneeshis moved into the nearby town of Antelope, took over the town council and voted in a big tax increase. The city's lost its identity as a little western town. We who have lived here for a long time have lost our homes. These steamroller tactics created the Rajneeshis' first bad press people started to ask questions. Instead of wondering why all the Rolls Royces, now Oregonians wondered why all the weapons at a religious commune. Wasco County residents worried about something else, that the rapidly growing population of Rajneeshis would take over. Then they can easily soon control Wasco County. You know, uh, what happened to Antelope can happen to the Dalles. What happened next fueled those fears. Rajneeshis recruited homeless men and women with promises of free food and housing, no strings attached. Oh yeah, somebody was telling about that. The Rajneeshis called it sharing, but people noticed the only homeless invited were citizens 18 and over. Sheila claimed they hadn't considered having the homeless vote until a reporter suggested it. I got accused of it that because I invited you, that was because I wanted to take over the county and the politics. I tell you, the county is so f***ing bigoted, it deserves to be taken over. 
Many of the homeless became disillusioned and left Rajneesh Puram before the election. They tell me I'm working with no pay, no social security, no workman's compensation. The Rajneeshi candidates dropped out when it became clear they couldn't win against a big turnout of other Wasco County voters. The whole experience caused the Bhagwan to break his silence. They want that this city should be demolished because of their land use laws. And none of those idiots has come to see how we are using the land. The situation at Rajneesh Puram then rapidly spun out of control. Immigration questioned why the Bhagwan was still in the country since he had entered on a temporary visa for medical reasons. Allegations surfaced that Rajneeshis had planned to poison the Dow's water supply to win the election and had actually poisoned salad bars. The Bhagwan's denials were hardly reassuring. If we had poisoned, then you will not have been able to come out of the grave <laughs> to give the evidence. The discovery of wiretapping and eavesdropping equipment revealed distrust among Rajneeshi leaders. Sheila and those loyal to her had bugged conversations, even the Bhagwans. What he called Sheila's gang fled to Germany. They have done such ugly things that you cannot believe. It was unbelievable. Rajneeshis accused Sheila and her gang of plotting to kill U.S. Attorney Charles Turner and Oregon Attorney General Dave Fronmeyer. Finally, on the day before a federal indictment charging him with immigration fraud, the Bhagwan and 14 disciples fled by plane. Federal agents intercepted the group when the plane stopped to refuel in North Carolina. In prison fatigues and handcuffs, the Bhagwan looked like a different man. As the news filtered into the commune, people began to realize that the Bhagwan was never coming back. And without the Bhagwan, there would be no Rajneesh Puran. This was Camelot. It came and it was here and it was beautiful and people from the outside attacked it and missed what was really going on and now it's gone. After four years of work and a hundred million dollars worth of construction, the Rajneeshi dream of a utopian city was over. Most Oregonians were more than ready for the end. Sheila was arrested in Germany, returned to the U.S. and served time for attempted murder. After her release, she returned to Europe, where some say she's living on money stolen from Rajneeshi businesses. The Bhagwan was deported. He returned to Pune, India, where he died shortly after changing his name to Osho. There are still Osho followers around the world. In a final irony, the Big Muddy Ranch now serves as a Young Life Christian camp. For much of the 20th century, the original Oregonians were all but forgotten. Most Native Americans lived on scattered Indian reservations created by a series of treaties in the 1800s. Recognized as sovereign nations, the tribes were supposed to be free to fish and hunt for traditional foods. This is bitter roots. But the fish and native plants were disappearing, along with the Native American way of life. When former Governor Douglas McKay became Secretary of the Interior in the Eisenhower administration, he thought Indians should just assimilate into American society persuaded Congress to declare that some tribes no longer existed. And in the 1950s, every tribe and band of Indians in Western Oregon and the Klamath and South Central Oregon lost their federal government to government relationship. They were legislatively terminated. But the tribes didn't disappear. They kept meeting and having powwows. Starting in 1977, tribes such as the Siletz, Klamath, Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sauslaw were reinstated by Congress. But most tribes no longer wanted the Bureau of Indian Affairs in control of their future. What that means is that the tribes must take a leadership role, must take an ownership role over their own destiny. Tribes began to build an economic future with agricultural enterprises. 
They put in fish hatcheries to try to re-establish salmon runs on rivers where they'd been essentially wiped out. But the big change came in 1988, when Congress gave tribes, as separate nations, the right to establish gambling casinos. Native Americans could literally win back some of the wealth they felt had been stolen from them. For Indians, the gaming proceeds mean their opportunity to chart a future that they before could never imagine. They now have jobs, they have educational funds for their young people, they can build their own wellness centers. It's allowed them for the first time to opt in or buy in to the economy of the state and be players in it. In the 1990s, two birds few people had ever heard of brought big changes to Oregon's wood products industry. First, the northern spotted owl, and then the marbled murrelet were listed as threatened species in danger of extinction because of loss of habitat. To search for a balance between timber jobs and protecting forest habitat, President Clinton organized the Northwest Forest Conference. The resulting plan reduced cutting on federal lands to a quarter of what it had been. The spotted owl came to symbolize two different views of Oregon's forest resources. In the cities, the Silicon Forest replaced timber as the biggest private employer. To this growing urban population, endangered owls symbolized an ecosystem out of balance. Outside the metro area, timber remains a vital part of the economy. To loggers, it appears environmentalists care more about owls than the families of timber workers. If the spotted owl brought changes to the timber industry, the listing of salmon as an endangered species will likely mean changes in the life of every Oregonian. The basic problem is that salmon evolved in an environment that man has so altered that the fish's very survival is in question. So we're reaping a legacy of being poor stewards of the land. We can correct these things. There are things that we can do. And we may be able to restore some of these resources that have been plundered or disrupted. That's the challenge for today, and I think for tomorrow. As the century comes to a close, there is serious talk of breaching dams to restore sections of free-flowing river. That would mean less cheap hydroelectric power, much higher costs for farmers to pump irrigation water, and perhaps an end to barge transportation on the river. Food prices could go up as farmers are forced to reduce pesticides and leave land unplanted near streams. Lumber prices may rise as timber companies modify harvesting by clear cuts and reduce road building. Recreationists will have to contend with logs placed in rivers to improve stream habitat. Homeowners may face higher taxes or sewer bills to clean up urban pollution. It's becoming clear that just as every Oregonian benefited from cheap hydro power and economic activities that harm salmon, everybody will have to participate in restoring healthy salmon runs. Near the end of the century, Oregonians made the process of voting a whole lot easier and made history again. In 1993, Oregon became the first state in the country to hold an election entirely by mail. Oregon voters really opened up a hornet's nest in 1994 by narrowly approving a ballot measure making Oregon the only state to legalize assisted suicide. Under the Death with Dignity Act, doctors could prescribe lethal doses for terminally ill patients with less than six months to live. Supporters said it gave patients control over their final days. Opponents claimed Oregon's Death with Dignity Act endorsed suicide and could evolve into involuntary euthanasia to relieve stress or the burden of mounting medical bills. The federal government delayed Oregon's law for three years by threatening to prosecute any doctor who wrote a lethal prescription. In the end, the feds backed down. Oregonians reaffirmed their support for assisted suicide by defeating a measure to repeal it, this time by a wide margin. While the law has been in effect only a short time, so far only a relative few patients have opted for assisted suicide. 
The Oregon Health Division has found no evidence of abuse or botched suicides. An OHSU study found that the publicity surrounding assisted suicide may have had a side benefit. Doctors are now more likely to prescribe adequate narcotics at the end of life, and fewer patients are dying in pain. Where is your pain now? Only oh, zero. Much huger number of people are affected by what we're doing in improving comfort care than the number of people who would ever utilize assisted suicide. In 1996, Oregonians awaited the arrival of one of the world's biggest movie stars. Keiko the Killer Whale, 7,000 pound star of Free Willy, was transported via UPS to Newport from a Mexico City amusement park. The orca was in poor health and came to the Oregon Coast Aquarium for rehabilitation. A specially trained staff worked with Keiko to improve his cardiovascular health and provide mental stimulation. The whale caused a tourist boom in Newport. Visitors from around the world flocked to see Keiko in his new home. But Oregon's love affair with Keiko was destined to be a short one. The goal had always been to return him to his natural habitat in the North Atlantic. We bid our movie star farewell in September of 1998. A U.S. Air Force C-17 delivered the famous cargo to a large pen in the waters off Iceland. Keiko continues to make progress there. His keepers hope that just like Free Willy, they will someday release Keiko to swim free in the ocean. On February 4th, Oregonians awoke to the news that the new Carissa, a 600-foot-long freighter, had run aground on Coos Bay Spit. 400,000 gallons of fuel oil on board were a threat to Oregon's prized beaches. A leak could devastate birds, including the western snowy plover, a threatened species. Oregonians demanded action. Unlike early in the century when news spread slowly, now we watch the new Carissa saga as it happened. The ship proved to be a stubborn problem. It took two tries to ignite the fuel oil in an attempt to burn it off before it leaked. But then the new Carissa split in half, and crews discovered a lot of unburned fuel still on board. So they tried pumping it off with limited success. The next idea was to drag the bow section off the sandbar and sink it in deep water. It took days, but finally, nearly a month after she ran aground, the new Carissa headed out to sea. Then, 40 miles out, the huge tow line broke. The next morning, the ship that refused to die was back, this time near Waldport. A few days later, the tug towed the new Carissa off the beach for good. But the tough old lady had one more surprise. After 69 rounds of destroyer gunfire, she was still afloat. Finally, a submarine torpedo sent the new Carissa to the bottom. Attention then turned to removing the smaller stern section. As catastrophes go, the new Carissa didn't amount to much. About 70,000 gallons of oil spilled, less than 1% of the Exxon Valdez disaster. Several hundred birds died, but the ecosystem escaped serious harm. The new Carissa showed Oregonians still demand that our precious shoreline be protected no matter the cost. And so many volunteers offered to help, some had to be turned away. Near the end of the century, the state celebrated the 150th anniversary of the arrival of the first large wagon trains on the Oregon Trail. Oregon's take pride on their pioneer legacy. Even those of us whose immigrant ancestors came directly from Sweden to Astoria or from t Texas or Oklahoma to the coast of Oregon, we take pride in that. The state's capital has a golden pioneer with an ax standing atop the rotunda. And the murals and the public art in that building celebrate pioneering activity. The Oregon Trail has become a symbol of freedom and looking for a better way of life. In this century, Oregonians justly take pride in looking for that better way with the nation's first water and air pollution laws, the bottle bill, and public ownership of beaches. Livability. Livability in Oregon. 
great theme for the 20th century. When Governor McCall championed protecting Oregon's environment, he predicted it would become the state's biggest asset. Because we'll have the things that enlightened industry wants for its workers and for its people when everybody else has destroyed them. He was right. Oregon is booming with businesses drawn by the quality of life. The irony is that at the same time the state was celebrating the pioneer anniversary, this new wave of settlers created threats to the very environment that attracted them here. I like to think, however, that there is, as McCall certainly saw, a certain quality of our relationship to the land that distinguishes Oregonians, the diversity of it, the great spaces that we have available here, those affect people's personalities. They always have. In the 21st century, we'll see if these newcomers change Oregon or if Oregon changes them. Production funding for Oregon's Memorable Century has been provided by the Collins Foundation. The Collins Foundation is dedicated to improving the quality of life in Oregon. Funding for local broadcast of this program has been provided by viewers like you and by the following. Entech International, creators of microporous membrane and battery separator materials. Entech International, leadership, commitment, and innovation worldwide.